Freddie Mercury's wild romantic life is the stuff of legends. The lead singer of Queen led the gold standard rock star lifestyle with crazy parties, drugs, lots of one night stands, and fiery short term romances that shaped Freddie's life and his music. Today, we're taking a look at the people that stole Freddie's heart and their stories. Freddie grew up in India with a family who practiced Zoroastrianism. Their beliefs and traditions stood as monumental barriers for Freddie's open exploration with his identity and sexuality. Zoroastrian teachings strongly forbid homosexual relationships, with passages stating that bi or homosexual love is a form of demon worship. As a result of these strict social and religious ties, Freddie dated women in his early years. Eventually, this led him to his first and only true love, Mary Austin. Freddie and Mary lived together and essentially became common law married. They also even got engaged. The two met in the 70s before Freddie's fame and fortune propelled him to immortal status. She loved him for him. At least, that's how it seemed. The two remained lifelong friends, but Freddie's bombshell reveal drove a wedge in their otherwise fairy tale story. Before they got hitched, Freddie confided in Austin the truth about his sexuality, that he was actually bi. Austin rejected this revelation. She, like many people back then, believed that you could either be straight or gay. There was no in-between. So she argued that he must have been secretly homosexual all along. This rejection broke Freddie for a time, but he stayed true to the love they once shared and even left Austin the majority of his wealth and estate after he died. Along with two of Freddie's other partners, Mary stuck with him during his final days, and she was the only person who knows Freddie's final resting place after she was told to bury his ashes in secret. While he was seeing Austin, Freddie's open relationship allowed him to see other people. So, while he was touring with Queen in their early days, he would frequently invite women into his private dressing room for one night stands. However, early into his rise to stardom, his bandmate Brian May began to notice a shift in Freddie's behavior, telling the Sunday Times in 2017, it was fairly obvious when the visitors to Freddie's dressing room started to change from hot chicks to hot men. Around a year before Austin and Freddie split, he began seeing his first boyfriend, David Menz. In what could be considered an affair, a side fling, or maybe just a polyamorous relationship, Freddie saw Menz in secret for almost three years. This secrecy was a common theme throughout Freddie's life. While Freddie clearly knew himself, he lived in a difficult time. His music and his outfits reflected his inner self, but he was unable to openly share his sexuality in the public light because of the persecution that LGBT people faced at that time. Although it was pretty obvious to everyone that Freddie was into guys, he hid the truth even at the very end. Some believe he encoded his journey of self-discovery in Bohemian Rhapsody with the line, Mama just killed a man, referring to letting go of his heterosexual life and stepping into his new self. Once Austin and Mercury split, Freddie bought a new apartment where he and Menz lived. One of the few remaining relics from this era of Freddie's life was immortalized in this postcard Freddie sent to Menz, reading, My dearest, I'm sorry about last night, but that's because I'm a dreadful tart. Love you with all my heart. Kisses, Merkel's XX. Their relationship was clearly not a fling, and fans even speculate that Menz inspired Freddie to write two songs, both Good Old Fashioned Lover Boy and You Take My Breath Away. But Menz and Freddie weren't destined to last. After they broke it off, Freddie found Joe Finelli in 1978. It's not well known that Freddie suffered panic attacks throughout his life, and Joe was said to be the only one of Freddie's lovers who knew how to help calm him down and care for him when he was suffering a panic attack. Their relationship only lasted a year before Finelli couldn't handle the pressure of hiding the relationship. For the next four years, he didn't speak to Freddie at all, but Freddie continued renewing Finelli's visa. The pair would reunite under different circumstances years later near the end of Freddie's life. This time, Joe worked as Freddie's personal chef, and the two rekindled their friendship. Freddie then invited Joe to move in with him and his partner, who we'll reveal shortly. Joe, Freddie, and the mystery partner continued to live together even after they learned the devastating news that all three of them were positive for HIV, and Joe would die just months after Freddie. In another year-long romance following Finelli, Freddie dated Tony Baston. The Baston saga was yet another tragedy for Freddie. Tony would also die of AIDS in 1986 at the age of 35, but before then, Baston worked as a delivery driver for DHL, a carrier specializing in international domestic shipments. However, things didn't last long as Freddie found out Tony was cheating on him while he was touring in the US with Queen. 
to get back at him, Fernie asked Tony to join him on tour in the States, but as soon as Tony landed, he broke up with him. Mercury did pay for Tony's return trip, but he ended up keeping his cat to add to his growing home of feline friends. Next up, we have Vince. Vince was a barman in LA who immediately ignited a fire in Freddie. Freddie's friend and autobiographer, Peter Freestone, said, Vince was tall, chunky, with dark hair. Vince wasn't overtly impressed by Freddie's fame, and Freddie always had to wait until Vince's shift at the bar was over before they went on somewhere else. It's almost like Vince played hard to get, and maybe his down-to-earth reaction to Freddie was what drew him in so much. By the time the 80s rolled around, Freddie was already world famous, and was probably used to getting the royal treatment everywhere he went. Freddie being forced to wait and being forced to actually impress Vince no doubt made him all the more enamored by the barman. Freddie asked Vince to quit his job and follow him on tour. Freddie would make all the arrangements and make sure he lived comfortably, but Vince turned him down saying, according to Freestone, I'm not prepared to give up my life for what could be six months before you tell me it's over and ship me back. Sorry, Freddie. While Vince was definitely smart for not uprooting his life for some rock star fantasy, Freddie was undoubtedly hurt and never went back to pursue him further. But what Freddie perceived as a spurn was anything but. Vince later said, I had seen Freddie in the video and I said to my friend, God, that guy is really hot. And then three weeks later, I'm in bed with him. I just couldn't believe it. Freddie was the highlight of my life, definitely. In another short-term relationship, Freddie dated Bill Reed in 1982. This was one of the low points for Freddie. Bill and Freddie got into a ton of fights, including one where Freddie screamed so much he almost had to cancel a show on Saturday Night Live back in September of that year. Thankfully, Peter came to the rescue and created a mini sauna with oils of Olbus to help heal Freddie's throat, and Mercury somehow performed the show. But that wasn't the end to their troubles. Bill and Freddie tore up a hotel room in one of their arguments, leaving broken glass in their wake. And he once bit Freddie's hand so badly it almost needed stitches. Bill would also die of AIDS. Following the nightmare time he had with Bill, Freddie found Winnie Kirschberger, restaurant worker from Germany. The pair spent three years together, and the pair gifted each other some lavish presents, with Freddie surprising him with an apartment and a car, and Winnie returned the favor with a ring. Freddie felt so comfortable with Winnie that he eased up the secrecy he kept so tight for many years and would later call Winnie his husband among their inner circle of friends. They even moved to Munich together, but their language differences proved to be too great. Winnie didn't put forth the effort to learn more English, and Freddie didn't try to learn German, so they broke up, and sadly, Winnie would also go on to die of AIDS. Freddie's last great love was Jim Hutton, the man who he lived with when Joe Finelli re-entered the picture. Freddie stayed with Jim from 1985 until he died in 1991. Jim moved in with Freddie at his home in Garden Lodge, London, and helped take care of him as he was on his deathbed. They became life partners in 1986, having an unofficial wedding with rings and vows, and went to Japan to celebrate their honeymoon. When Freddie learned of his terminal illness, Freddie thought Jim would hate him. He said he would understand if Jim wanted to leave, but Hutton confirmed his commitment saying, I love you, Freddie, I'm not going anywhere. Freddie Mercury faced a difficult uphill battle in his love life during a time when being gay or bisexual was considered a crime or taboo in most places. Without proper healthcare and support, many LGBT members didn't have the care they needed, but Freddie helped champion the LGBT community pushing gender boundaries even with the very name of their band. While Freddie struggled to date for many years, he finally found the love he needed before he left us, and that's an inspiring love story for the ages.